Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Carolyn Gehrig, who is the founder of Hospital Glam, which is a social movement based on a hashtag and um, selfies taking uh, back the clinical space. I think it's a brilliant project. I absolutely fell in love with the concept when I saw the photos. Carolyn, you've recently spoken at Stanford's MedEx, so welcome. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what inspired you and, and, and uh, what brought about this fantastic project? Sure. Um, uh, so I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome in 2003, and then around 2006, I got involved with um, the New York City uh, EDS group. Uh, and then we changed the name to EDS NYC, and um, I uh, worked with them until 2010, um, at which point I moved to Los Angeles. And then I've been kicking around Los Angeles for a couple of years, and I have gotten sicker in that time. Um, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is a progressive uh, connective tissue disorder, um, and it's progressive because time moves forward and uh, ravages us all in sort of, uh, you know, the ways it ravages even healthy people. Um, so uh, in the last year or so, I had gotten sicker, um, and I knew that I would be in doctor's offices more often than uh, I had been in the past. And um, usually I go to the doctors alone, um, so I wanted to show that I could... Um, be in a doctor's office and uh, kind of be there for myself and um, support myself there in that way, still represent myself on social media um, as like having a normal life because this is a normal life. It's just a different kind of normal. There are so many people who are sick and where this is a part of our daily lives. Um, and I, I don't think it's any less valid than, um, I don't know, people who have children or people who uh, have normal office jobs or anything like that, you know? Um, so while other people are taking selfies at Starbucks, I started taking self-portraits in the doctor's offices. Um, initially, I had taken some point of view shots, but then I realized that that asked the viewer of these um, photos to look through my eyes and when uh, an able-bodied person looks um, looks at a hospital setting like through someone's eyes they just think injury and they think pain and they think illness and there's no way to normalize it for them and there's no way for them to think like oh okay well this is a regular routine and this is just something that they are going through um, and this is okay for this other person. And I wanted to force a viewpoint and I wanted them to look at me and realize that um, this was a part of my life and that this is, this is okay for me. Or I mean, not okay, okay, I'm still sick and I'm still dealing with stuff, but as okay as it's going to be. Um, I also, at the same time, uh, ha I'm a feminist and I have an ongoing issue with um, the way women are positioned in media. Um, and so uh, I was looking at a lot of ads and a lot of um, the magazines in waiting rooms and ads on billboards, etc. And I would see these images of women uh, with their bodies positioned in kind of like sick ways where um, their shoulders were slumped forwards or they were slumped off to the sides and they just looked sick. And I'm not talking about body frame. I'm not talking about um, low weights. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking purely about positioning. Um, and I thought how strange it was that these are the same images that were being used to sell us good health and wellness and like these um, these ideas that like health and wellness would were sexy and would bring you um, were, like were equated with wealth. Um, so I thought that by using my actual disabled body and posing it in similar ways um, and in reinserting it in a clinical environment, 
that might be interesting. Um, so I brought that in as well and started posting those online. And eventually, uh, after like eight or nine months of those, I aggregated them onto a single website. I had been posting them on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook for in the interim period. Um, but once I aggregated them uh, onto a single site, um, I started, I got attention immediately. Um, and uh, other people started to do it too, um, which is kind of the best part because um, now we can sort of go forward and be a tidal wave and change the way we view clinical space. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I, and I actually came came across your work through someone else posting on, on the hashtag. Um, yeah, Heather. Yeah, and she's fantastic. I love Mortuary Report. Which is yeah, she's great. great. Um, but, but I really, you know, I, I, I had to dive deeper straight away. It was something that, that struck a chord with me. Uh, I mean, the, the, both you and, and Heather both have a obviously deeply artistic bent because you, the way that you pose the, the photos is very cleverly composed. They're you know, artfully shot. Um, but at the same time, you know, you're, you're inverting the normality of, or, or sorry, inverting the, or it's rewind, subverting the, 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 the way that it would be done if it was a magazine shot and, and injecting that your day to day normality, which I think is right. You know, we, we spend a lot of time hiding people's disabilities, hiding people's illness. You know, there are millions of people out there with hidden disabilities that are unseen um, that ought not to be. And I think it's, it's fantastic what, what you are doing so far. You, you know, you, you're creating a, you know, very visible um, movement that's very, I feel, I feel empowering. And I think I've lost you. Who oh, we lost? Deborah. We lost oh, Deborah. We lost yeah. Deborah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, it's great. I'm, I'm, I'm really, ex you know, excited with what you're doing. I think that more people should be doing this. So, you know, we want you know, to encourage people, draw attention to the movement that you're creating. Um, but I know that you're interested in how you can create an online community, but also bring that community to bear in the real world, because that's something that, that I think is, is sometimes disconnected. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, I feel like that works straight into accessibility concerns. Um, because I've noticed that um, my world became much more accessible to me when I started uh, hanging out with people who had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or other disabilities in, um, in a concrete physical space. Um, and that started happening back in New York. Um, and I wasn't hanging out with them socially as often as I was in a support group capacity, but then eventually it did move to like socially hanging out with people. Um, and now uh, some of my best friends are people, uh, are other people with disabilities. Um, actually, that's totally inaccurate. Um, I would say all of my closest friends <laughs> are other people with disabilities um, uh, because it's, I don't know, it's just easiest to communicate with other people um, who understand what I'm going through uh, or understand what I'm dealing with. And most of the time we don't talk about our physical issues other than as a side note, like, oh yeah, I'm just having trouble today because of the thing. And then we talk about the other stuff, like real life stuff that everyone talks about and that everyone deals with. Um, but it's just understood as a baseline condition. And I think once you have that understanding as a baseline condition, you can move on and grow and do all of the other things that you want to do um, in an easier way. And I think that that's something that um, most people enjoy and take for granted um, and that uh, people with disabilities don't necessarily get to enjoy and take for granted because we live uh, in an in a world that's designed for able-bodied people. What type of um, reaction do you get from healthcare professionals? Um, I 
I'm very forceful, <laughs> um, uh, and I'm very aggressive, and I'm uh, and I'm also very friendly. At the same time, um, I don't, I never really have a problem because I state my needs. Um, sometimes I don't get, um, I don't get the treatment that I need in a time uh, frame in which I want it, um, and then I and then I find someone else. Like, I treat it kind of like dating, or I treat it kind of like anything else where. Um, it's a relationship and I have to treat my relationship with my doctor who's another human being with respect and also understand that they're a human who's trying to treat me Um, and sometimes we're not we're just not going to click and we're not going to mesh up so uh, if that's not working then I try and find another care provider but I don't I don't run into too many problems because um, I go into appointments and look at what are our goals working together? Um, What do we want to get out of each appointment? And I understand that I have a chronic condition that has a lot of other problems. So every time I go in, I'm not looking for an answer. I'm looking for how we can fix the problem that I'm in there, that I'm currently uh, in the room for, or how we can make progress uh, for the problem that's presenting at the moment. So, so we're looking for strategies rather than, you know, coping strategies rather than, than, than a cure because you know that, that it's, right. not, it's not a cure. So you're wanting, a, you know, effective stuff to help you live your, your day-to-day life as best as possible, right? I do. Um, and I also want, um, I also want under, I want understanding and I want them to be on the same page and also, uh, be interested in looking forward and at looking whether uh, at whether or not different new symptoms are connected or if they're indicative of things progressing in a way that uh, I don't want them to be that you know like progressing um, I yeah it it's it's just kind of like um, looking for anyone else who's working or who's good at something um, that that's pretty much it yeah. And also recognizing that they're human. Um, I tend to have, yeah. 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 I tend to have good relationships with them. But I also understand, you know, I understand that they're people and I've been doing this for a long time. And I, I know that they, um, not know, but I hope that they understand that I've been doing this for a long time as well. I have had a couple of not so great experiences where I've met younger students um, or fellows or new doctors who come in and um, have not or have seen that I've had a giant history but have not necessarily read it and oh I'm kicking off my blankets um sorry uh and have uh I don't know just haven't talked to my other doctors and are not really prepared for me um and then I only see them that one time and I'm out because uh, I'm not going to be able to build a relationship with them. And they're looking for a, like they're looking for simplicity. They don't really know how to deal with it. Um, And I think if I had a more simple set of conditions, I would maybe engage with them further, but I I don't, and I don't really have time uh, to teach someone at this point. So that type of friction that is happening is related with the fact that you know they are not being teach or trained in order to be able to deal with 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 that. What what is missing for them to to be able to you know somebody as young to to medical profession to be able to 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 stop and say maybe I should behave differently. Well, I think they're just overwhelmed at um, having a patient with a large set of diagnoses. And then um, I think maybe they go into the room with the assumption that um, I want everything cured or everything stopped and they don't give me credit as a patient uh, at all for knowing a- anything really. Um, which I, which so. I, I, I've got friends with long-term chronic illness as well and, and where they have illnesses that are quite rare it's quite often that they're a much greater expert than the doctors that they're seeing. Uh, yeah. They can't prescribe for themselves. So a lot of the time, 
yeah, it, it requires some recognition on on the part of the medical professionals that that you know yourself and your condition is far better because you're the one living through it. You're the one dealing with the the conditions. You understand what's happening in your own body far better. Right. I, I think it's unfortunate that um, I, for some of the doctors, I think it's unfortunate that I know that and don't question that. I think for some of the younger doctors, yeah. that's unfortunate. But um, I don't know, maybe it's a learning experience, maybe not. Um, I don't go back to them. No, and I think everyone needs to, to self-advocate. Uh, self-advocate. Uh, it's yeah. something that I'm, I'm <clears throat> passionate about because if we don't speak up for ourselves, then people will speak on our behalf and they'll make assumptions that are incorrect. I know Deborah is trying to join us. I think she's joined us by phone. She's having a few technical issues. Might be due to the hurricane. I think so, the best way for Deborah is to write the question and then we'll ask a question for her. Okay. Can y'all hear me oh, if I talk? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. So, you know, I, I think I applaud what you're doing. I, I think it's so important and, and, and I didn't know about it. And so now that I know, uh, I want to help. So, <clears throat> but I have a I have a, a a woman that works with me. Her name is Rosemary Musashio, and Rosemary was born with cerebral palsy. And Rosemary cannot communicate in the traditional way. And so she um, she she has said to me that when she lies down, all she can do is blink her eyes. That's you know the the amount of control she has over her body, but she is this brilliant, beautiful woman that just, she's a master's degree. She has accomplished a lot in her lifetime, but when she has had to go multiple times in the hospital, she's treated like she's a vegetable and she, she's just, and she's often treated that way in society too. When she's traveling with her mother, people, they don't see her and it's, it's not, it's almost like they're, they're afraid of her. And, and so I think the work you're doing is so brilliant because recently walking some illness path with my mother, it's amazing how they don't see her as a person, they see her as a symptom. And so, and, and they, it seems like she loses all of her civil rights. Uh, we recently went into a doctor's office because she's bleeding behind her eyes. And I was just so shocked at the way they treated her and everybody around her. And I, I could tell they're, they're, they're diligent, loving, amazing people, but they don't see her as an entire person. They see the symptom. Um, or, or the condition. And so I, um, gosh, the work you're doing is so important. It's just so important because if we can see you as an individual, as a person, um, you know, and, and I thought it was such a powerful thing that you said earlier, um, your life is normal. You know, who's to say my life is more normal than your life? Your life is normal. It's your life. So I, I just think, I, I almost, don't, I don't have a question. I'm just I'm I'm just uh, I'm just really really appreciative of the work you're doing because it, it this is what we need to really change people's perspective on what does it mean to be a human being. So I, I really applaud you and I'm so glad Neil invited you to be on Access Chat. But we want to help. We I know all three of us are very involved in social media, but I'm very impressed with what you're doing. Thank you. Um, I think. Uh, Doing hospital land, like the actual act of it has been extremely powerful for me from day one. I mean, from before it became a big thing online, just the act of standing in the room and taking the photographs of myself um, felt big. Um, because putting, I, I use a self timer on my phone and I set it down to repeat at 10 second intervals. And then um, I kind of set up the frame, kind of like the same way that I'm holding my um, my uh, air, my air up here, and you can see like the boundary is here, so you can see where I can move in here. Um, I would set up a frame similar to that, and I would know this is how much space I have, and then this is my space too. 
and um, letting the camera go and having it face outward and not um, not being able to look into uh, into the lens and like check at what I look like during it and just like take up the space and acknowledge like where I am in the space and the other items in the space and um, it made me feel like uh, it was mine. Um, it also made me more aware of my body and it made me able to think of like, okay, these are the things that I want to discuss during this appointment. And it made me feel a little bit more powerful. And then my doctor would walk in and I would either grab the, I would either just grab my phone and put it down or, I mean, now I don't bother because my, my doctors know, so they'll either hand it to me if I'm not feeling well or, you know, just like laugh about it for a second. And then the appointment goes on, but then I would be ready and I'd be ready to go and talking about it. And I'd feel like I was on their level because I'd feel like the space was mine too. And like, it was my workspace because I had been working in that space for a couple of minutes. Um, and that's like, that's a powerful thing because those rooms are designed for, they're, they're designed for us to be in too, but we're not, we're not really in them. Um, like we move through them and like we sit in a corner and we go like, okay, are we allowed to touch that? Oh, I really want to blow my nose and there's a tissue box over there. Is it okay if I do that? And I mean, it's, it's there to be used, yes. but we like, but it's not for us. So just taking up that space on our own, it feels good. I don't know, it, it just makes a really big difference. Yeah, so it, it's a powerful act of claiming that space. I think it's, yeah. it's really ob obviously important. How do you translate that and translate the stuff that you've done and the, the movement that has grown around Hospital Glam? Because there's a lot of people posting now and even some guys as well. I, you know, mm -hmm. There's a few, uh, a few brave souls. Um, so how do we take that advocacy work that, that each that you're doing and, and that each person that's posting, because they're all advocates, because they're all braving, uh, putting their images out there. How do we maximize the potential of, of what they're doing to, to try and turn stuff around? What do you think we, w would be the next steps? Well, I think it's still, I think that is still in its infancy um, in a lot of ways, because as you've said, it is only a couple of men and it is, um, there's still some confusion about what the project is um, in as much as uh, some people think it's about looking pretty in a hospital, which, you know, it's, it's not. It's, I still applaud people feeling good about themselves in those spaces because I think that that is really important. And I think if you can go into that space and you can feel good and you can feel good about yourself and about, how you are throughout your stay and that gives you power good i think anything that makes you feel more powerful and better able to advocate for yourself cool um and i i don't want to take that away from anybody and i don't want to like i i still think that that's valid so um cool um i think that we can advance it with men um, and uh, break down, I guess, the idea of what traditional masculinity is, which is like no frailty. Um, I, I've noticed that a lot of the men that I've seen participating in the, in the project are queer, um, which makes sense to me because there's less of an idea of um, like needing to assume strength at all times. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Which I think is hard for men because I think it's hard for men to, to say, um, I'm disabled and to come out with disabilities uh, to the world. I think it's, I think it's really hard. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you're, there's this social expectation that as a man, you're brought up, you know, you're, you're meant to be virile and strong and the, the hunter gatherer provider and all of this kind of BS, um, which you know, insight is not necessarily the case, but there's the expectation and a lot of us try and live up to that expectation. I think it's actually um, probably eating people up inside. I know that yeah. that actually when 
I finally sort of succumbed and, and had my diagnosis of dyslexia and stuff like that, I cried for quite a long time because it so suddenly everything made sense and actually understood um, why things were the way they were. Um, and actually now I spend a lot of time actually being very openly dyslexic. I've come out I, um, about my neurodiversity. I believe other people should too because it has a hidden disability and it's not a physical one. Um, but it has effects on, on the way you live. It's really important that you talk about it and that people um, people get to understand that you are different, not less. Right, exactly. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, I think that it, I think that it's harder on men. I, I think the disability is in a lot of ways harder on men because of the ways in which women are socialized. Um, and I think that it, we have to find a way for, um, I don't know, for men to like let go and handle their disabilities. Hey, we um, can't even make an appointment with well. the doctors because we, we, <laughs> we're, we're, we're much less prone to go to the doctors because we'll wait until a bit of us is falling off. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I can, tell you, I can tell you stories about having literally been dragged out of my house by my friend Mandy <laughs> to go to the ER because I didn't, yeah. I just didn't want to go. And I thought like, uh, they can find my body. Like I can die here. That's, that's okay. Like maybe this is it. Maybe it's enough for me. Um, because you just don't want to go when you're this, when you're that sick. But, um, I think that we can make strides in all directions. If, if we're around other people who are disabled and we see them and we think like, this is okay. Um, so, uh, let, let's talk about you a little bit, Neil, and let's talk about um, your, so you are talking about uh, your dyslexia and like operating in, operating uh, neuroatypically in a neurotypical world. That's, I mean, that's intense. Like that's, like the world around you is designed in a different way. Um, if you have, like, if it, mm, being around other people who experience what you do, is that a powerful thing? Oh, like, when oh, you yeah, are yeah. around oh, them? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there are, you know, I, I'm a bit like a, a neurodiverse Pied Piper. Similar for yeah, EDS. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, um, you know, I, I will collect people. Um, and I was collected. So, <laughs> so yeah, it happens. You gravitate to people that understand, understand you. And, and, and now I spend a lot of time trying to mentor people that are, are, are neurodiverse. And a lot of them are brilliant people, like, um, like Lena, who we had on a couple of months back. She's on the autistic spectrum. She's absolutely brilliant. Great mind, really sharp. Um, but... You know, we, we do think, see things differently. I spent a lot of time as a child thinking, but people are different. Uh, I feel different. I don't know how I explain that. I couldn't really understand at that point what it was. I just felt something. And it was only later on when I actually went to work for a company that was specializing in in that topic, in, in dyslexia and so on, that actually it's like, well, this is so close to home, I better just go and get myself tested and, and admit to it. Even though a close friend of mine had been telling me for years, come on, man, you're dyslexic. I'm, I'm, you know, no, I'm not. You know, I've done, you know, I've done all these things. I'm not. I'm not. I've got coping strategies, honestly. You know, want to, want to conform. Actually, now I'm happy not conforming. Because, yeah. Because actually, you know what, I'm much more comfortable in my own skin by not having to conform. And I, I know that this is something we've chatted about online. And, and you know, it's like when, when I mention conformity, I can feel your hackles <laughs> rising. And, you know, so, so I'm really, really um, uh, happy to, to be a, a fellow nonconformist. Um, so tell us about your bright yellow hair and how that came about as well, because we were talking about conformity and, and, and everything. Oh, yeah. Um, so uh, around 
when um, when I started going to the doctors a lot more often, um, I was uh, being diagnosed with a brain tumor, um, which is not something that I talk about that much on the internet for a couple of reasons. One of them is that um, it was very difficult for me to access in-person support um, at the time. Uh, um, I experienced uh, you know, just some problems with my family, and um, I had a very, I had one of my best friends uh, who was also a sick person just ditched me, just flat out ditched me. So that was kind of heartbreaking. Um, and so I decided uh, not to talk about it that openly because um, whenever whenever I'm able to get rid of this thing, um, I'm still going to be sick. I'm still going to have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome yeah. and um, I'm, I'm always going to be sick and that's always going to get worse. So I don't have um, a traditional like, oh, there's a tumor. Oh, um, let's get her better drive. Like there's none of that like hopefulness. There's none of that arc. So it's, been a little bit difficult to handle in that respect. Um, but around that time, um, I decided, you know what, let me just dye my hair blonde because it was something that I always wanted to do. I've been a redhead uh, since childhood. Um, and so I dyed it uh, platinum blonde and it's been like shades of platinum blonde with some neon yellow in there. Sometimes I dump in different colors. Um, because I figured that um, it would fall out and so it didn't matter if it was unhealthy. Um, and also that I was beginning this project that was based in media and I wanted to give it the best possible, um, the best possible footing. So I thought that being blonde was a decidedly uh, political decision okay. um, because blonde women are uh, more highly regarded uh, socially and culturally um, and a, for whatever reason and I thought that conforming as closely to a conventional standard of beauty would actually help push um, push disabilities closer to the center of a narrative um, which I don't know I mean, the pictures did get some attention, so. Oh, yeah. That's, <laughs> so that so, so it worked what? in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if they would have, I mean, maybe it would have done the same as a redhead, but um, it doesn't, you know, who knows? Okay. And now I'm blonde. When, it, when it's in black and white, obviously you've got the, you've got the color contrast as well. So I know you've. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when you're taking the moody shots, yeah, it works well. Um, I think we're closing towards uh, the end of our half hour. So it's gone really quick and it's been brilliant. I'm really looking forward to our Twitter chat. Right. Oh, but even, um, so for anybody who's listening though, even if you, if you have the opportunity to go to an in-person support group, even if you think it's going to be horrible or if you think that you're not going to get along with anyone, just do it because um, time moves forward and you really have no idea what's going to happen or whether or, it, or not it's going to be horrible. And then there are going to be chances for other ones. So just do it. Just start meeting other people in person because you will learn other things from physically being in the room with other people, whether it's the way that someone glances at a clock or the way that they hold their hands or something else. You will learn something. It doesn't have to be about gaining emotional support. Just look at it as a learning endeavor and you will get something out of it regardless. Yeah. Um, and then that's a good first step. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. Um, I, I personally have support groups and, and they're informal, but my father, who's also um, got Parkinson's and a brain tumor, um, goes to a support group and actually it's made a huge difference. It's not so much in terms of the, the support, but actually he's going out and doing stuff with a new group of friends as well. And I think that's, that's something that's, that's really important to, um, that shouldn't be discounted. So once again, thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, it's thank been you. great chatting with you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you.